Shubham, can you play the national anthem? Sure. पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा बिंद हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 Thank you so much. Uh, Benjamin Franklin once said, "An investment in knowledge pays the best interest." Good mo uh, good evening to one and all present here. I, Sparsh, on behalf of Nari Gursahani Law College. welcomes you to this event which will be discussing the newer investments in the attainment of knowledge it is indeed my honor to be anchoring the 8th padma bhushan dr l h hiranandani memorial talk today for the event we are graced by the presence of okara speakers dr niranjan hiranandani and mrs asima kutino who will put forth their views on the topic for today digitization of education new opportunities and challenges with that i now request our beloved principal dr chandni rimani to welcome all our esteemed guests thank you sparsh a very good evening to honorable dr niranjan hiranandani sir to principal hemlata bagla to our canadian guest speaker uh, who will be joining us shortly and the wonderful enthusiastic hr team of students who are giving us technical support and my dear students to sketch the life of padma bhushan dr l h hira nandani is to pluck stars from the heaven because he was such an amazing and a unique humanitarian even today he stands out as the tallest figure of the hsnc board and he is a lighthouse for the board colleges from 2013 the year we lost him nari gursani law college has been hosting seminars workshops competitions in his memory this year we decided on the 8th memorial event to engage our students in a talk on digitization of education when dr l h hiranandani was 82 years young he decided to go to germany to learn a new technique of a surgery now this was despite the fact that he had ceased to perform procedures because he had parkinson but he had the burning desire to learn new things and to adapt to the changing times my dear students today we are seeing a sea change in education because of the pandemic and the national education policy 2020 so let us learn a lesson from our beloved dr l h hiranandani and embrace this transformation in education with joy on this momentous occasion we couldn't have had a person better than our own honorable dr niranjan hiranandani sir to deliver the keynote address he has brought about a total metamorphosis in the hsnc board he has made us unlearn learn and relearn sir we are indeed honored to have you with us on this pleasant occasion we are also privileged and fortunate to have with us a canadian guest speaker from the toronto school board and she happens to be my former school student 
and I'm certain that she is going to enlighten and enrich us with her views and experiences on digitization of education in Canada. On behalf of all assembled here, I extend a very warm welcome to both our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, I now take this blissful opportunity to pray, pay tribute to Dr. L. H. Hiranandani by bestowing his encomiums. Dr. Lakumal Hiranand Hiranandani was an Indian otoharyngologist, uh, auto social activist, and philanthropist. Born in 1917 in Tata of then Sindh province, Dr. Hiranandani had limited financial means, but his ambition and ability defeated the former. He is known for pioneering several surgical procedures, which later came to be known as Dr. Hiranandani's operations. He was the founder chairman of Hiranandani Foundation Trust, which was reported to have been active in the social movement against organ trade in India. He initiated treatment protocol for throat cancer, an initiative which was considered outside the purview of an ENT surgeon till then, which reportedly integrated heart, head and neck surgeries with PNT. He was a recipient of the Golden Award of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, the first Indian and the fifth overall to receive the honor. The government of India awarded him with the third highest civilian honor of Padma Bhushan in 1972 for his contribution to medicine and society. Dr. Hira Nandani was a member of American Society of Head and Neck Surgery, the first Indian to be accorded membership at the AHNS. In his struggle, triumph and life is embedded the story of a man who contributed to make the world a better place to live in. In 1972, when the drought hit Mumbai, Hiranandani abandoned his medical practice to organize medical aid and immunization camps for the drought affected people, serving as the honorary medical director. The next year, he worked in Bihar and Odisha, which were affected by floods then. And in the aftermath of Bombay riots in 1993, he worked for organizing medical aid to the injured. His dream was to wipe every tear from every eye, especially in Udhasnagar, a city close to his heart. He was a simple man who acted in a manner different from the rest of us. Magnanimity came to him very easily. He could show grace even in difficult situations. He effortlessly established magical relationships with people, big or small, and made them feel special. It was his consoling word or soothing touch as much as being in the presence of his kindness that left an indelible imprint in one's memory. For the HS insights, he was a shepherd. He remained behind the herd, allowing others to go forward without realizing that all along they were being detected and supported from behind. As every great deed begets another, every great leader like Dr. L. H. Hiranandani inspires other leaders to great this. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what the difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we have led. This is the lesson that we all have learned from our dear and beloved doctor. Dr. L. H. Hira Nandani, a legend, completed his journey on earth on 5th September, 2013. His story is an inspiration to millions which shall last for an eternity. Relly is a person loved and respected so much and by so many as the tallest patron. We all have lost a great human being and nothing can diminish the profound and enduring loss of this good Samaritan and the symbol of peace with his aura of gr gracious humility and unimpeachable integrity. Instead of mourning for him, which surely he would not have liked, we celebrate his remarkable life, his achievements and his contributions to, the, uh, to his service and towards the society and the mankind, which is why today is a very special day and we are hoping that we are blessed by the divine uh, presence of Dr. L. H. Hiranandani somewhere. With that, I move on and most respectfully introduce the keynote speaker for today. It is indeed my privilege to introduce Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, Niranjan sir is the trustee and past president of 
the Hyderabad Sin National Collegiate Board, which runs about 17 colleges and eight schools across Mumbai. He's also the president of uh, Associated Chambers of Commerce and Industry and the national president for the National Real Estate Development Council, functioning under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Born in the family of legendary Padma Bhushan ENT specialist, Dr. L. H. Randangani, sir, kept on his legacy of the father. He is an alumnus of the Campion School of Mumbai and a rank holder in commerce from the Mumbai University. He completed his FCA from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India and has been conferred a doctoral degree in management for his thesis on real estate. Early on, Dr. Hiranandani began his career as a professional in a CA institute followed by a short span of experience in the textile industry. The intellectual and entrepreneurship skill gave him the vision to look beyond this. And then he stepped into real estate industry. Dr. Hiranandani is the founder, co-founder and managing director at Hiranandani Group. Remarkably, sir, the first generation entrepreneur and his hard work and dedication made him a legend in the field of real estate. Not just that, he's globally renowned as a developer or because, of his, because of the body of his work. For example, the redefining skyline of Mumbai and delivering landmark global projects like Hiranandani Gardens at Pawai, among many others. Sir has played a leadership role in various industry bodies and contributed vastly to the policy framing township developments through his enriched and vast experience. Yet, with the little that I've heard of him, it seems that Sir's zest for life, willingness to serve the society and belief in his promise makes him do a lot, lot more. Which reminds me of the most recent achievement, the HSNC University of Mumbai, which Sir is, of which Sir is the provost a collective dream of all trustees realized by the hard work of each and every member of the HSNC board. So has also been appointed as the member of task force to make recommendations to the government on the national education policy. I have a really candid memory of sirs, which I would like to reiterate. Sir's journey is so glorious, but sir still insists not to take it very seriously. Sir rather insisted that uh, there's so much more that he wants to do and can do which will always remind me of the speech that he gave us uh, where he shared his life mantra. He said, do your best and do better than the best. So it truly is an inspiration and an excellent example of walking the talk. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing this occasion. Because you are our keynote speaker, we would love to hear a few words from you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deliba Chandiramani for having this in the memory of Dr. L. H. Hiranandani, Padma Bhushan, and uh, illustrious CNT specialist. It's really wonderful and grateful to you for all that that you have arranged. And so, Sparsh, you have left me speechless. Actually, I I'm quite overwhelmed with all your introductions, both of Dr. L. H. Hiranandani and myself, uh, that I don't know whether I can even speak anymore. Uh, I'm still reeling with uh, all the thought processes that you have just put across to me. So thank you very much for all that. Yes, uh, Dr. Eli Chiranandani was a great teacher. He also, besides everything that you have said, was very fond of teaching people. And he always felt that the more you teach, the better you spread knowledge and sharing of information would also be wonderful because that recaps your memory and you remember it better. So when you actually present ideas and thoughts, it reinforces whatever you have learned. And that was one of the teachings which he constantly put across. So he was a very, very good teacher also. And he remembered, uh, rem I remember that part of, it, him, of him also. But also the fact that uh, he had a lot of empathy for people and that empathy went on up to the age of 96 when he went away. But what you said is correct. He always lived a life of celebrations and never believed that there was anything that we could not celebrate because there are positive things to see in every secondary negative distress. And so it is with what happened with the HSNC board and the HSNC university now being built. When we were in March of 2020, we had a course on thought that we will work together 
with the new university, the HSNC University. And there was a lot of excitement among the entire board and all the principals of all the colleges actually were duly excited in order to create new ideas and thoughts. Let me go in retrospect. In about October, November of last year, when the first the formation of the university took place, there was a challenge, a challenge which was very funny. We wanted to do at least 20% of all education in future to be online. In Diwali of 20, 20, uh, sorry, 2019, this was 2019 when all these discussions took place. And there was a huge debate. Why do you need online education? There is nothing into it. People don't learn very well through the online courses. Why are you looking at that part of it as a part of the education thing? Come 2020 March, and we were challenged. We were challenged by the COVID situation and the lockdown which took place. It put everybody behind it. And suddenly we realized what is the benefit of the entire course of online education. So we go back to the subject of today and what is it that digitalization has done to India? That's what the prime minister has been saying, that we need to move on technology platform. We need to get everything digitized. And this is exactly what we are doing today. One of the big things which happened was the Arogya Setu app, which has been created. It actually warns each person who registers on it as to whether you're going closer to an area which has got COVID people or are you in a safer area? Are you safe or are you not safe? Can you imagine a digitization platform which can actually tell the health of the person or the danger in which he can be simply by looking at the app? Digitization has shown the way. All these aspects of it have become important because today we have the comfort of being able to sit in our homes or in places where we are today, wherever we are, to be able to see each other, to talk to each other, to see that our discourses take place so that we can actually be in touch with other virtually, not personally, but yes, so be it. At least it's a substitute for the purposes of doing. Today, we can't imagine. When I was young, there was no TV. Can you believe that? It's unbelievable. So when I went to the junior classes that I did in school, no TV at all. Later on, we had a black and white TV and we had movies on Sundays and everybody would sit at home on Sundays to watch Dur Darshan's one movie that came up on the TV screen. That from that to the changes which have taken place. And today I'm all familiar, all familiar with desktops, mobile devices, the internet, software application, digital textbooks, you name it and things are there. You have animations, you have virtual laboratories, you have textbooks, you have the Kindle, all these digital devices which have come up we are now taking for granted. But it was not so some time ago. What India has done is been able to leapfrog on the new digital era which has taken place. And we are now amongst the forefronts of use of digital media in the entire world. Funnily, and most was wonderfully, even each farmer has a bank account which is digitally operated. That too, where amounts which were to be given to farmers are not handed over by cash in the old system, which meant that the farmer actually did not receive even a one third of the money. But today he gets it directly when the government gives him that benefit. All these things have taken place now. Today, on the education side, what is the major difference? We have been able to get onto online teaching. And there I must congratulate Principal Dilipa Chandiramani, Emlata Bagla, whom I'm seeing over here, the other principals, the teachers who are over here, and all the team of people who are there in all the education institutions across the board 
to have got 100% online. Is there a problem? Of course there is. Any new methodology of change is going to have its own set of problems. And here is the main thing. Give me a new mobile phone and I'm in trouble because it takes a hell of a long time to get used to the new upgrades of the telephones and mobiles which take place. Give me a new laptop. I'm equally puzzled. But in a couple of days, we all get familiar with it. So the same problem we have with the digital platforms of online education. The teachers have difficulties because they've never done it before. And the challenges which are there are not easy to meet in view of the fact that these platforms are also experimental. Lots of things and changes have to be done. Software upgrades, software upgrades of all these platforms take place on a weekly basis, which means that they are not perfect. They need to be upgraded in order to suit the situation which merits on it. What's the other changes which have taken place due to digitization? Those are very, very radical. Something which I never believed would happen in my generation at all. And that is content. Content is a big challenge. In my school days, my college days, what was it? Mainly it was content learning and memorization of content and repetition of content in the examination. And the more effectively I repeated content, the better it was for me so that I would get good grades, good marks, and hence good results, and hence my opportunities in the future when I went for a job and otherwise would be assured because of the content that I knew and also the methodologies that I follow. What's happening? Everything has changed. Content is, is available on Google. It's available on Safari. It's available on all digital platforms. Easy to get. So what is it? It's a very big equalizer. It means that good, bad, ugly in terms of memory, you still have the accessibility to good data. But that is not enough, which means that in the future, children, students, and elders, and even people who are working, and even teachers, will be challenged with the fact of not only teaching material, which is to be memorized, but it will be a learning process of how to do. Let's take an example. Many of us in the law degree and law, you have to do research for the purposes of your cases. Earlier, you have to wade through books and books and books and books and books, papers and articles and research papers. And it took days, weeks and months in order to prepare for a case. Today, with the platforms that you have, it's easy to do research on any subject that you want in order to do it. So you are now challenged because A, B, C, D, E lawyer will be able to access the same reference contents as any other lawyer. So now you have to go to the next level. How you have to learn and to do better research, how to learn and be able to take up other qualities which a lawyer requires to be done. So a lot of work will be treated as acceptable. And even if you're not the best in memory contents, you can still be a great lawyer in today's date. Yes, of course, there would be a big advantage if you could have the memory of all the laws that are there and whatever it is to be done will be easier because you don't have to refer to them. Plus, when you are prepared to do memorization of things, it becomes a practice. So if you have five law briefs and you have to appear for it during the day, if you have practiced memorization in our college time and repetition, you will be able to take five briefs in a day and then appear for them one after the other simply because you have a good memory. So don't lose the strength of having a good memory. Don't believe 
that you don't have to learn. Learning is a continuous process. And the more that you learn, the better it is for you. But you have a platform, you have a tool, you have an instrument which will enable you to make life easier in terms of doing whatever it is. The next important part of digitalization is the reach that we do. Today, when we want to communicate, as we are there, you're sitting in Ulasnagar, you may be sitting in Mumbai. We are now having our guest speaker speaking from Canada, Toronto, and it'd be a wonderful thing to hear her speak. Could we do this some time back? No, we couldn't. Simply because it was not possible to do so. But today, we not only have a wonderful learned speaker speaking to us from Toronto, but also the listeners can be anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. And I think that's another advantage of digitalization of knowledge and gyan and these things can be recorded and kept. The other major advantage of digitization is recording of data, recording of lectures. And again, of course, the next one step, which we are now doing, is online examinations. None of this was even dreamt of a couple of years ago because online teaching itself was remote. Forget online examinations. But with the COVID situation, India, we, our colleges, our boards, our universities have done a leapfrog into the next technology world, in the new digital world. And we have all these instruments available to us for the purposes of leapfrogging with the use of technology in the others. So what was considered to be a very difficult story, the COVID story is difficult. It's horrible, it's terrible, for especially people who are negatively affected, especially the elderly. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful about your elders and parents and other people who may get affected by COVID because they have a greater uh, chances of problems which will not be there to the young people. So please be very, very careful that you don't spread all these things to all the people that is there. The other part of it, which is extremely important, is to see that you take advantage of digitalization and use it as a positive instrument. What do I mean by that? Let's say I have to appear in an examination in order to learn. We spend, let's say, five hours to read a particular thing. But by going online, you can finish it in two hours. So you have a three hours spare time that you have in order to do reading. So instead of saying that I'll finish it in two hours because I have all these resources to be available to us, you work three hours more, you go into the next level of working. And why am I suggesting this to young people today? Why not tell them to have fun for the balance three hours? The answer is very simple. We are now going to be living in a very competitive world where things are going to become extremely competitive, no matter what it is, whatever the profession, the legal profession, the medical profession, the engineering uh, qualification, all these areas have equal digitalization. But if you're not competitive in your field, and if you do not put in that extra labor, you will not stand out. So what do you want to be? An ordinary guy, an ordinary lawyer, are you going to be an ordinary teacher? Are you going to be an ordinary person? Or by using the media that you have, the digital media, the resources of all these items which have now come about, are you going to leapfrog into the next world? Is online teaching and digital teaching going to substitute for classroom treatment? My belief is no, it's not going to take place because there is a benefit of classroom learning. The interaction between students, between students and teachers in a classroom has a different effect completely. But for the purposes of teaching, we have research which has been done, which says that blended learning is probably 
something which is going to work very well. So online learning along with classroom learning, which we call now blended learning, is going to be the order of the day. So what does it mean and how does it become advantage to you and me in the future? So we may both qualify our examinations. We complete our LNP, become BSc, engineering, doctors, medicine. But with online education being available, digital media being available, I can be learning every single day. That's the biggest advantage of all. I can continue to learn from the digital media all the activities, not necessarily your subject. You can do so many other things. For instance, you can learn the yoga. You can learn public speaking. You can learn languages. You can learn so many things now available on the internet. And this will important to impart because you can then see that not only are you good at the law and content, but you're good at debating of going on doing your uh, uh, court work or what you do in the college as mock courts. All these things can be done by imbibing soft skills. And you can continue learning as Dr. L.H. Hiranandani did even at the age of 82, 84, goes to Germany to learn a new operation. So those are the kind of examples that we have, which is very, very important. And the digital media helps you in order to do this part. There is another advantage with the digital media education. It helps the students to work and study at their own pace. I am a fast learner. Somebody may be a slow learner, but that doesn't matter. And I, you all, both of us know the story of the hare and the tortoise. And I can tell you that the story is equally true for a person called Niranjan Hiranandan. I can tell you and share with you that there was a classmate of mine in BCom. He was brilliant. You give him a textbook and give him two days to learn it. And he wouldn't have to bother to read it again. He'd just throw it away because he would be having a memory situation. I was a prodder at that point of time. And a slower learner than him. I was always jealous of him. I felt so angry because he would be able to learn and memorize pages after pages after pages after pages and all that and just skim through the bloody book. I was so annoyed, you know, seeing him. But he was my friend. So I said, okay. Now what to do? I can't lose a friend. And we continue to be friends even till today. But when it came to four years of college and at the final year, I beat him like hell. Simply because I was a rank holder, he was not. And he, he did well, but he didn't do as well as I did. So it doesn't matter whether you are an ordinary student or a great, brilliant student the level at which you will now do with all these digital media is not how good the media is for you. It doesn't matter if you have the best mobile or the best laptop. As long as you know how to use it well, these media will help you to catapult to the next level. It's a very efficient instrument, provided you use it, provided you use it well. And you know, and I know, we can always misuse the internet. Don't you know that? You know that. But if you use it much, much more than what you misuse it, it will be useful for you because it will take you to the next level in life. Why do I say all this to you? Because I've gone through the same experience of negative use of all instruments in life. That's what I did in my younger age. And I don't blame anybody who does it today. But I can tell you that if you can expect more time in positive use of all the digital media and the platforms that you are blessed with, which I didn't have when I was in school or college, I think you'll be able to take off to the moon and be able to be great. We all know that you are the generation which will bring India to the next level. And we should become the frontiers in the entire world. Our prime minister keeps on saying it's the students of the world which will make the generation next. It's the children 
which are going to create a new India. And that is exactly what I do believe too. So yes, digitalization in India has happened. A lot of laws are now going to be passed, wherein we are going to see that most of the digital media is collected and stored within the country. There is a law likely to be passed in the near future. So we will keep an eye and a flag off on that. But more than anything else, any instrument that you have, use it well. People have a knife. You can use a knife for cutting bread, for cutting your uh, food, which you need to do and chop and scream, or you can kill somebody. What would you do? Would you kill somebody or would you chop your food and use it? So your digital media, your mobile phone, all these instruments that you have are similar instruments like a knife. Use it well, it will serve you well. Use it well and you will reach the next level. It will be a platform for each one of you to take off through the moon, which was not available to me when I was younger. So I congratulate the principal for a wonderful platform that she has created for teaching and learning for all of you to getting onto the online platform, to hosting this entire program today. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me too. Thank you, Sparsh for the wonderful you, introductions that you did. Thank you all, Hema Bagla, other principals, all the teachers who are here today, and of course, my young students. You will not be good. You will not be better. You will not be best. You will be better than the best. And I promise you that we will take full utilization of all the digital media that I have to become wonderful people and great students and great citizens of India. Take it to the next level. I love you all. Looking forward to see you again at another occasion and probably, hopefully, personally. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we also cannot wait, you, wait to see you personally and have a conversation with you. Thank you so much for guiding all our participants today in the positive use of technology also giving them a holistic approach as to um, be uh, broadening the aspect and going beyond the textbook learning and going and learning uh, soft skills too. Thank you so much, sir, for guiding. Now, uh, with... Uh, First one minute, I will just welcome Mrs. Kutino. She has joined. Sure, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma yes ma'am. Fortunately, Mrs. Kutino could join in. And we are really privileged to have this educator from the Toronto School Board, District School Board, to be the guest speaker for the 8th Padma Bhushan, Dr. L.H. Hiranandani. It's a privilege having you with us, Mrs. Kutino. Uh, she happens to be my former school student, and I'm sure she's going to enrich us with her views and experiences on digitization of education in Canada. Asima, I welcome you on behalf of the HSNC board, Nari Gursani Law College, and all assembled here. Thank you so much for being with us. And a big, big warm welcome to you. Taking a cue from that, uh, now I request Rashika Rohra to introduce our guest speaker for today, Mrs. Asima Kutino. Thank you, Spurs. I cherish this opportunity to introduce Mrs. Asima Kasi Kutino an indigenous lady with positivity and confident personality. Since last 10 years, ma'am is member of Toronto District School Board. Mrs. Coutinho is an educator who teaches kindergarten to eighth grade students in various schools across TDSB. Ma'am is passionate about teaching STEM. She's lead teacher and teacher librarian along with the mental health and well-being coach, as well as uses CRRP. Mrs. Coutinho has specialties in KG, English as a, second, as a second language, ethical leadership from York University, Toronto. Ma'am was born, brought up, and was educated in Mumbai. Interestingly, ma'am was student of our beloved principal, Dr. Nilima Chandiramani, ma'am. Prior settling, uh, settling in Canada, ma'am has gained a lot of experience in Dubai for eight years in, Mo in a Montessori school. Ma'am, in her summer breaks, volunteered as a reading mentor in Bhutan Canada Foundation. Tanzania, Zanzibar, and Indonesia through Muslim charity organization for the child education. 
and that is not it ma'am her ma'am has also keen interest in arts music dance drama and environmental education she has also worked with dr uh, salim ali and a noted ornithologist of india to conclude in own words of mrs kutino education is a remarkable tool it should always bring happiness opportunities and curiosity if you get give if you learn teach with your presence ma'am we are sure you have walked the talk and it is just a pleasure to have you with us today all the way from canada thank you so much ma'am for coming so first of all i want to thank everybody for giving me this opportunity to be with you all and this is one advantage of digitization um i will try first to check if my screen can be shared with you is it are you able to see me yes ma'am the screen is visible is the screen visible yes ma'am yes yes it is visible please go ahead and you can hear me also right yes, yes. ma'am you are very clear okay. mrs kutin okay so first of all i want to thank mrs chandiramani and all the participants and uh, also to mr hiranandani uh, his talk his speech has left me speechless he has um educated so well all the points that even i went back down memory lanes yes in my days too there was less of technology and we had to do lot of face to face learning but as i went to the teachers college then was i experiencing the technology in the whole world you know but coming to canada i saw a new aspect of technology to start with i just want to highlight that mr hiranandani just spoke so well on all the points as to what india is doing in digitization and that is very nice to hear and i feel proud to be an indian now an indo canadian but in this part of the world digitization is a powerful trend in terms of reform reformation and modernization the thing we do here in the global education and the environment environment is about the text the sound the visuals video and other data from various sources but not only that the process of digitization in education most actively is taking place in the modern world one of the contradictions that seriously is impeding the modern modernization of education is the discrepancy between the speed of digitization and the educational resources and the speed at which the digitization of educational process itself is very low that means people have all the access the resources to technology here but it is not that progressive people lack manpower and um the it techs in this industry to really bring this digitization to the forefront yes the north americans and americans are forward in this but the brain power behind that is sometimes lacking yes and they need that power during this pandemic we have all realized that the educators across the globe was put in a state of panic to do teaching right from kindergarten to the high school level through media platforms and we are still struggling the only thing i want to bring to your point is each one of you to reflect on the fact that does digitization truly works for the masses around the globe what concerns questions do you have about supporting student needs when learning moves online give it a thought and think about it my story i will highlight a little bit in the 1980s when i was teaching in private institutions without a teacher training the only thing mattered was the qualification that i had from university but in the 1990s teacher qualifications became mandatory and we had to enroll in the program and take my ba qualifications and believe me it was difficult then to get in and there was pressure of even paying donations to the teachers college which is not the case here in the western world 
this part of the world, everything is fair and equitable. Nobody is asked to pay any kind of donation. You get everything on the merit. You get what you study and you get your percentages. Then when I started working in Dubai, the teacher's qualification in class or distance learning never mattered. What mattered was getting a job in the Dubai schools because Dubai was then developing and they wanted staff to operate schools. But in the millennium in the 2000s, when we came to Toronto, we were exposed to a totally different new world of the teaching profession. We had to go to a, through a teacher's college called the Ontario College of Teachers, or in short, it is called OCT. This meant a teacher who wanted to teach here had to go through a certification process. And if we successfully met all the criteria, we got to teach. If not, we had to go through a teaching program here as per the standards of Ontario College of Teachers. Believe me, no teacher got certified who had a distance learning qualification. That means digitization or education had through the long distance process was not acknowledged. So what does that tell me? What about learning digitally? Do I get certified? But ultimately I got certified because I had my qualification directly from the Mumbai University. Here I will ask each one of you to think, is it worth digitalization? Let's move on. Move on in what direction? In the developing world, many people ask us, what is developing world? It depends on how strong and reliable its educational system is to produce the best minds to innovate and bring new solutions to that country's challenges. Often the task is automatically falls on the teachers who generally get blamed for the failures of the educational system, but rarely get the praise for its successes. In this modern times, the era of technology where students ICT literacy has come to the fore because of its potential for economic development. Teachers are in the for, front, front four line for anyone who thinks the education system is not doing enough to prepare the learners for the 21st century. What does USA import from India? Do you know that? They really import people, some smart people from IIT. The IIT graduates are a hot property as they are the leading consumers in the most top companies in the US. Nehruji, our late first prime minister, created IIT. And today, India is providing brain power to the whole world. And I'm proud to hear and read this in the news as an Indian in this part of the world. Most of the IIT people, even in my school board, the Toronto District School Board, belong from India. Most of the science and math teachers are from India. The digitization in education in today's world is all about power. The Western world has a lot of money and money is power. During this pandemic, I've seen the government spend millions of dollars in technology, but who are the master brains to provide and train for this technology were all Indians. In developing countries, access to ICT in schools is very limited and costly in the rare instance where it is provided. The expectation is therefore that as soon as technologies, mainly computers are available in schools, teachers would universally make great use of them. And just like a magic wand, improve students learning and overall ICT lit literacy, all of which is to contribute to the development of the con concerned countries. Such has been the thinking behind many developing countries investments in the one laptop per child project and many other similar projects. I would like to highlight here one of my recent experiences. Especially in Toronto, the government has spent more than $22 million on technology to provide technology for each and every child at home. They have also given internet connection, internet um, bill payments for the family and also an instrument for the child to learn. Is this possible around the globe? I don't think so. 
I know many children in India are still struggling to go online because of the lack of technology. So is distance learning a really good tool for every child in this world? It depends on your financial background, how you can afford it. Distance education is based on new digital technologies, opportunities, and it is again a separate issue in terms of education and digitalization trend. One of the core benefits of integrating digital technologies, even as Mr. Hiranandani mentioned, it has to be the blended form. So students interact with the teachers, with their peers in the school classroom, and also have the access to technology. But distance learning is really causing other aspects of mental health issues also in this part of the world. Um, I would like to stress more on what is digital technologies. Do they help teachers or reduce paperwork? Exercise books and reports are replaced by laptops or tablets with all the required academic information available. Home task of students, except when special teachers references are required, can be automatically controlled by the software tools. Everything is available on the internet. Sometimes students feel, is there a need for us to go to school? No. Sometimes children do want to go to school and interact with their peers, with their teachers. And we have seen this has taken a toll on the pandemic period when the children were confined to home. It's their time, their age to play and learn, and that is being deprived. But we have to first take care of our health. I want to also highlight what is distance learning in US and Canada. In US and Canada, when we have distance learning opportunities, we do learn from home, but we also have one component uh, which ties up with the Distance Education Accrediting Commission, which is also called DEAC. So what happens in this is any kind of field, whether it is dentistry, medicine, engineering, we do learn online. We also have to do one compulsory option that is, uh, it is called a co-op education or a, a component that has to be fulfilled as a volunteer, voluntary hours in a setup. Like if you're learning dentistry, you have to spend six months working with a dentist and if you're taking a course from US, from a reputed US dentistry college, you can still do that six month of uh, in-class training with a dentist in Toronto. For example, if I have to do a specialized uh, teaching program, I can take it from USA, but I will have to fulfill those six months of my training under a specialized institution in Canada or say from close to my home in Toronto. So this gives an advantage to people to learn. And during this pandemic, many such courses were offered and people were still learning and making use of their time to learn and educate themselves. So that is the advantage of distance learning. What happens in the developing countries? A question to think. Not everybody has the fortunate um, um, situation to have a distance learning approach. Developing countries, for example, according to the statistical information of the Global Bank, China had some 19 computers for every 100, student, 100 students or say people in 2001. But now they have access to many more technology or instruments. With a population of 1.3 billion people, China is the most populated country in the world. However, a very small proportion of its GDP is invested in education, less than 3%. The number of countries like Brazil ha has almost the same GDP, but on an average, say for 6.2 uh, um, world's population, Iran has a such statistical evidence on the access of the schools to the technological education much more than Brazil or China. However, some observations show that there is a huge gap between the possibility of the students' access to the opportunities of using the information and technology at schools. 
countries like Bhutan, Tanzania, and Zanzibar, where I have visited during my summer programs, they have zero technology access. Every school is still blackboard and teacher uses a chalk to teach the children. They don't even have a access to say simple uh, digital tools like a projector or a slide presentation. And that was an eye opening for me. I've also seen lots of uh, students in Canada who come under refugee status, who are new to the technology and find it difficult to embed into the education program because of the lack of technology on, in the developing countries, we have to really train these children to come at par with the education system in Canada. My next question is, is digitization in education helpful in elementary, secondary, or post-university education? I'll pose this few bullet points for you to think about a real world scenario where is digitization acceptable and where it is not whether in the elementary school like primary classes from kindergarten to grade three junior classes grade two four to five or six and intermediate classes from grade to seven and eight secondary schools nine to twelve grade nine to twelve postgraduate university college or master program where do you think digitization fits in because the pandemic has really given us an um, eye opener into this where which type of age group of children are really struggling. Now coming to the pros and cons of digitization. Digital education is generating new learning opportunities, no doubt, but students engaging in online digital environments and as faculty change of educational practices through the use of hybrid courses, or with new collaboration models and wide array of innovative and engaging learning strategies. Furthermore, a 21st century view of learner success requires students to not only be thoughtful consumers of digital content, as Mr. Hiranandini, Hiranandani also mentioned, that we have to make the right use of technology. It's not all about what access you have, it's all about how you make a good use of that technology that is provided to you. The effective and collaborative creators of the digital media, demonstrating competencies and communicating ideas through dynamic storytelling, data visualization, and content curation. Today, we wouldn't have been talking to one another if there was no digitalization of education system or there was no technology. I would like to show you a small clipping here about uh, Dr. Goel, who's expressing his views rather than me telling you what is the pros of digitization. So let's go and see this video here. Can you hear the video? Uh, no, ma'am, it is not audible. Perhaps because we turned the volume down? Uh, no, ma'am, uh, on top of your screen, where, you know, there is a panel where it shows, uh, you know, a green and then view option. View option? Yeah. Where is that? Oh, uh, ma'am, on the top of your screen, middle uh, top. Yeah. So over there, there is an option called uh, share computer sound. Share computer sound. So once you click that, uh, whatever you share, we'll be able to hear the audio of that as well. So I'm not finding it. Um, did you click on view options? Uh, yeah. Once you click on view options, uh, if you to check from the bottom, you will find it on the second spot. Second or third spot. Oh boy. So yeah, technology, this is what I'm also learning now. 
uh, well i will share the link with you so i'll just highlight the points what oh uh, ma'am if you want i can uh, share the screen and show the video uh, yeah sure sure are you able to do it yeah but uh, this is a second you will have to share the link with me did you get the link uh, just a second yeah Oh, so this. Sorry about that. Hello everyone. Let us begin with a show of hands. How many people here are or have been teachers? If you have ever taught a class or a workshop or symposium, raise your hand. Good, very good. I have lot many fellow teachers in this audience. Now, all teachers know that the most satisfying, the most fulfilling teaching experience of those in which we make a personal connection with a student and then we can share our joy of learning with him or her that's how we make a difference the same is true for students also most of us have taken at least 100 classes in our school and college how many classes do you remember i remember only a handful I remember those handful of classes in which the teachers somehow made a personal connection they made learning personal and fun in the ancient world children of the elite used to go to these small schools to learn from master teachers every student got personal attention but the education was accessible and affordable only by a few with the industrial revolution education reached the masses accessibility and affordability became big issues so education had to scale up but at the cost of personal attention today we have lots of classes with 100 or more students few students get personal attention we even have this massively open online classes in which students learn from pre-recorded video lessons some of these classes attract 100,000 students but only 10% or less completed complete because because lack of teaching assistance and personal attention this raises a fundamental issue for us can we have personal attention at scale what if what if we could give personal attention to every student when and how he or she needs it Now I think that would create an educational revolution. It would create an educational revolution because learning and teaching would become personal again. Now I work on artificial intelligence, AI. And my goal is to use AI to make education fun. It all began in January 2014 when Georgia Tech started a new educational program. they call it online masters of science in computer science the program offers graduate level classes professors record video lessons students can access these video lessons through a company called udacity professors teaching assistants and students engage with each other through an online discussion forum developed by another company called piazza
most popular courses in this program. About 350 students take this course every semester. By now, about 2,000 students have taken it. When we offered it for the first time, we had a surprise. The discussion forum is extremely active. The discussion forum acts as a virtual classroom in which students and teachers and teaching assistants engage with each other through conversations and debates and discussions. It's a real beating heart of the classroom. In spring 2015, 350 students posted 10,000 messages. 10,000 messages. There's like 100 emails each day for the next 100 days. A rough estimate is that it would take a teacher working full time for a full year to answer all of these messages. So in the summer of 2015, I thought that perhaps we could develop an AI teaching assistant that could automatically answer frequently asked questions. All of us teachers know, all of those of you who raised your hands, all of us know that students ask the same questions again and again and again. So we thought if we could automatically answer these repetitive questions, then we could free the teaching staff to focus on more creative aspects of the course. But answering repetitive questions is not easy. There are three superficial forms of the same question. Same question, three forms. You and I as humans immediately get it. These are three superficial forms of the same question. How will an AI understand it? How do we teach an AI that this is the same question and therefore the AI must develop similar answers to all three questions? We started working on this automated artificial intelligence teaching assistant that we call Jill Watson in fall of 2015. From IBM, I get, got access to IBM Bluemix. There's the more recent version of IBM Watson that had played the Jeopardy competition. Many people, I'm sure, know about it. From Piazza, I got access to all the data from previous semesters. Paro Lavasti, a graduate student in my lab, analyzed all the data and identified many categories of frequently asked questions. The pace picked up in late fall of 2015 when Lilith Petty, another graduate student in the class, in my lab and a teaching assistant for the class, joined the project. Together, we constructed the first version of Jill Watson. This is how we constructed Jill Watson. By the way, I'm going to teach you how to build an AI agent. There is going to be a quiz at the end. You don't pass the quiz, you don't go home. So pay attention. First, we took all the question answer pairs from the previous. It's almost nearing the end of the presentation. I just thought I would share that uh, link because Dr. Goyal highlights what is the importance of digitization in this part of the world and how it can be used. So what the basic, um, in short, what I will say is he emphasized on using technology in the classroom. It allows you to experiment more in the pedagogy and the instant feedback that you get. Technology in the classroom also helps to ensure full participation of the students. There are countless resources for enhancing education and making learning more fun and effective. Like even Dr. Hiranandani mentioned that we, we have so much of access to the bank of the internet and Google. It's like a digital encyclopedia, which we used to use during our times, like Britannica and stuff. But now everything is available digital, digitally. Technology can automate a lot of our tedious works. Robots have come into use uh, for different various tasks. With technology in the classroom, students have instant access to fresh information that can supplement their learning experience. We live in a digital, digital world and technology is a life skill for the future generation. Um, one of the pros that I would highlight is 
today I wouldn't be sitting with you all miles away um, and also interacting with you people in India, which is a boon and a blessing of technology. The cons of digitization are basically technology in the classroom is a distraction, which is my firsthand experience. Children get distracted. They try to go to different sites, even when we are doing the learning, because we use technology in the classroom. We have a blended form, but because of the pandemic, now we are mostly doing uh, online learning, which even we are not able to monitor the child, whether he or she is doing the learning that we on the teacher at the other end are teaching. So that is the biggest drawback of online learning that we have found. Technology can also disconnect students from social interactions because they are glued 24 hours to the screen. Technology can foster cheating in class and on assignments. And we have experienced this with our students. Students don't have equal access to technological resources. Like I mentioned, Toronto is a place where we have a blend of population from immigration, um, say, um, the refugee status people who do not have even simple technology at home, but the government and the school board provides them, but they make misuse of it. We have spent millions of dollars, but the technology is not used by them in an appropriate way because they take it as a toy or a playing instrument. Students don't really value the quality of education that they get here because they have too many advantages at their disposal and um, the education aspect is really neglected. The quality of research and sources they find may not be at the top notch. Lesson planning becomes more laborious for teachers with technology. Safety of the instructor is at stake many a times. And this I will emphasize because many students videotape the teachers, post it on media like Facebook with uh, offensive remarks. And that is causing a lot of tensions for the teachers and educators here in the Western part of the world. Several, several barriers exist in student success in an online format. That is what we have experienced. We cannot cater to the needs of all the needy students, especially the students with special needs, because the distance from the class to class or face to face learning is a big impact with the digitalization. So my last question on this cons of digitization is, is money spent on technology utilized well for the purpose of learning? This is a question to think for all of you. The final verdict is the technology in the classroom. Does it really help you? Uh, well, I can say that it does and it does not. But the key to technology in the classroom is always, is always going to be the teacher-student relationship, which even Mr. Hiranandani mentioned. Even I give an emphasis to the teacher-student uh, relationship because that creates a bond which I personally experience with Mrs. Chanderamani because that's where the education happens. I have learned so much growing up from Mrs. Chanderamani as an educator. I try to bring that in my teaching experience. Technology can be a highly effective tool, but that's not all it is. It's a only tool today. In today's hyper-connected world, sensible use of technology can enhance education only when it is rightly used. The uses of technology are widespread. Technology is not meant to replace the teacher. Rather, the idea is to create a flexible learning environment that breeds innovation. It shifts the classroom experience from the sage on a stage approach to a more collaborative learning environment. The success of such endeavors will ultimately depend upon how technology is applied to keep students engaged. It can be frustrating and time consuming, but in the end, technology in education can open doors to new experiences, new discoveries, and new ways of learning and collaborating. To end our talk, I will request each one of you to give a thought on this question. How can universal design for learning support online learning? This is a question for you to think after my 
uh, to, uh, presentation. I hope you all have got something to take away from it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me through Mrs. Chanderamani and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madhu, uh, for throwing uh, a light on the practical aspects of uh, the teaching learning process through digitization. Now, without further ado, I would now like to call upon Rashika Rora to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Sparsh. The best and beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be, uh, they must be felt by heart. Thank you is one such prayer among them. I, Rashika, on behalf of Nadi Gurushani Law College, consider it a great privilege to propose vote of thanks on 8th Padma Bhushan Dr. L.H. Hiranandani Memorial Talk. Thank you, Niranjan, sir, for sharing your words of wisdom on positive use of technology in terms of education and inspiring us to do better than be others. And also a big thank you to Mrs. Kutino for putting light on the important parts of digitalization and online education and supporting us in this event all the way from Canada. I would also like to thank HR College and their technical team, Durvi uh, Sangvi, um, Subham Sangvi, Harsh Modi, for providing us this stable platform for this occasion. Last but not the least, I would also thank all the participants present over here today with us for this talk. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in in this memorial talk and making it, making it a big occasion for us. Thank you so much. Have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Asima. It was really wonderful listening to you. You have given us an in-depth analysis and especially your experiences in Canada. Thank you so much for being with us. And I'll definitely thank you. forward... Yes, Asima. It's good to thank see you. you thank you for giving me that opportunity and I'll always cherish your teaching and learning in my journey. Thank you, Asima. Today you have taught me something and I will forward you. <laughs> you, you have always been my role model and I try to be the same with my students and I get the same experience. You it's are so better. Cool. You are better. Thank you so much, Asima. Thank you, and your kindness. Thank you, Asima. And we'll be in touch with you again. Thank sure. you, Niranjan. Thank you, Niranjan, sir. Thank you, Hemlata Bagla, for being with us. Thank, thanks to the HR team and to all my dear students. It was wonderful having all of you and making this event a memorable one. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we can now end the meeting. Thank you, Sparsh. Thank you, Rashika. Thank you, madam. Thank you.